My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to do a video on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an inherited condition which is characterized by increased muscularity of the heart with no good explanation. This is the heart muscle here and in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the muscle looks abnormally muscular. It is more muscular than you would expect and that there's no good other explanation because sometimes the muscularity can simply be due to things like high blood pressure where the heart has to work harder and that can then cause the heart muscle to thicken. But in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the heart muscle is abnormal because of a genetic defect and therefore the heart muscle looks abnormally thicker and more muscular. Uh, it is caused by mutations in the genes that encode the co components of the contractile apparatus of the heart. The muscle itself is abnormal. One thing to understand about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that even though it is inherited, the muscularity, the visual appearance of increased muscularity may become apparent later on in life. So you can be fooled because you may not know you've inherited it. Someone can do a scan, look at the heart and look and say it's all normal. And you may then develop those changes from this abnormal gene that uh, the patient has inherited later on in life. And that's just really important to be aware of. It's an important condition for several reasons, okay? Number one, it is common. Number two, it can be manifest at any age, meaning that you inherit the gene, but you know you can start developing the changes of the increased muscularity at any age. It can be asymptomatic, so many patients can have no idea that this is going on in their heart. But the problem with this is that because the heart is actually becoming more and more muscular, it will trigger off changes. A muscular abnormal heart muscle can also predispose patients to all sorts of heart rhythm disturbances and I think it would be true to say that most heart rhythm disturbances are more common when your heart muscle is abnormal, so atrial fibrillation, but more importantly ventricular heart rhythms like ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be a dangerous condition because of this abnormal heart muscle which can trigger off things like ventricular fibrillation out of the blue. It is probably the most common cause of sudden death in patients under the age of 30 years of age and certainly the most common cause of death in athletes and it is something that if detected early you can put measures in place to reduce the risk and that's why it's such an important condition. I think it is also important to know that when uh, sometimes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does cause symptoms and they can affect a person's quality of life badly and most importantly this is a condition that is inherited so the sufferer can pass it on to their children and it is really important that if you are the first degree relative of someone who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that you get checked out because as I say it can be completely asymptomatic you may not be bothered by the fact that it's there but it could expose you to these dangerous heart rhythm disturbances which can suddenly cause cardiac arrest out of the blue and that's why it's important that anyone who has a first degree relative with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy undergoes surveillance, goes to a cardiologist, gets checked out and probably needs to continue getting checked out at regular intervals during the course of their life to make sure they're not developing later on in life. Now, how common is it? We estimate that the prevalence is between 1 in 200 to 1 in 500 people. We think it's probably even more common now because we have better imaging techniques like cardiac MRI because MRI offers better clarity of the heart muscle and so we are now diagnosing it more often because of these new technologies. I think another thing to understand about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that in general the abnormal muscularity can be anywhere but tends to be more in one part of the heart compared to other parts of the heart. So if you, for example, had a more muscular heart because you were an athlete or a more muscular heart because you had high blood pressure, generally all of the heart muscle would be more muscular. This is called concentric ventricular hypertrophy. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, one of the features that is commonly observed is asymmetric hypertrophy, meaning 
that some parts of the heart are more thickened than other parts. And that points to this kind of disease process rather than a compensatory mechanism from the heart working too hard. Uh, and commonly the hypertrophy or the abnormal muscularity tends to be here. Okay, just here like this. Now, what's really interesting is if you observe this, this is your septum and the blood would normally go from here into through this valve. And in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this septum starts bulging out. So this becomes really thick. And not only does that help make the diagnosis, but it also has relevance because of these structures which are very close to the septum. Uh, the first being the mitral valve here. And the second is this outflow so that the outflow of blood has to go in through this valve and this muscle if it gets thickened could cause a problem with that which I will discuss in a few minutes. One of the really important things to understand is that some people have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and some people have something called obstructive hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. By obstructive I mean that this abnormal muscle over here actually starts obstructing the blood flow out of the heart. So because you get a big bulge here, the blood which would ordinarily just go through cannot go through. And there are two reasons for that. One, because this is narrowing the effective orifice to let the blood come out. But also if this gets really thick, it can actually cause the blood to interfere with this valve here, the mitral valve, as you can see, and the mitral valve can sometimes get sucked in and obstruct the flow as well. And this is called systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, SAM, uh, and that is one of the other mechanisms by which it can be more difficult for the heart to pump blood out in conditions of hypertrophic, in the condition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One, just because of this uh, abnormal heart muscle causing making it more difficult for the blood to come out but two because of the proximity of the mitral valve which can suck the mitral valve in and in some way the mitral valve sort of flaps and stops the heart pumping the blood out it obstructs the flow of the blood so those patients who have those features are termed as having hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy you can still have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which may not necessarily be obstructive but it's just worth understanding that so hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is otherwise known as HOCM H-O-C-M and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is just known as HCM. What are the symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, a lot of patients may have no symptoms whatsoever and it just gets picked up incidentally. You know, the patient goes for a scan or has an ECG or even uh, someone hears a heart murmur. The heart murmur is caused by this increased turbulence of blood through this abnormally thickened heart muscle and that can be heard by an astute doctor as a murmur and the, patient, the doctor may say I've heard a murmur let's do an echo and the echo shows this. Alternatively because the heart muscle is abnormal you could see the ECG to demonstrate very large complexes because there's more heart muscle for this electricity to go through and that may show up on an ECG routinely triggers off an echo and you pick it up that way. Of course, they can cause symptoms, and symptoms are largely because of, uh, one, the obstructive components. So if the blood cannot get out as quickly, particularly at times of stress, then the patient may complain of breathlessness, uh, they may complain of fatigue, they compl may complain of exercise intolerance, they may even complain of dizziness or even blackouts. Uh, especially during or immediately after exertion. So if you have any of those symptoms, you know, it's important to have at the very least an echocardiogram to make sure you don't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy given uh, its high prevalence. Uh, of course, patients uh, with weak hearts, or with not weak hearts, but with diseased hearts are more prone to heart rhythm disturbances. So the first time a patient may present is because they develop atrial fibrillation or they may develop uh, extra beats or something like that. They go, they have an echo, and that's when the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy gets picked up. So that's another presentation, heart rhythm abnormalities. Okay, why do the symptoms happen? Firstly, as I say, there can be an obstructive component because the blood cannot get pushed out as easily. That can cause symptoms of breathlessness, dizziness, blackouts, etc. And also the valve getting sucked in, causing a leaky valve, because if the valve is actually obstructing flow, it's actually not doing what it's meant to do. So that can cause a leaky valve that can contribute to the breathlessness. It's also important to know that when you have a lot of muscle, then that muscle can in some way outstrip its own blood supply. And because it outstrips its own blood supply, the muscle starts becoming weaker. 
and becoming more irritable. And that is another mechanism by which patients can develop the symptoms associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think it's also important to realize that when the heart muscle is abnormally thickened, uh, it doesn't relax as well. A thicker, more muscular heart is a stiffer heart. The problem with that is if the heart is stiff, it cannot fill with as much blood. Because it cannot fill with as much blood, it cannot pump as much blood out. Because as much blood doesn't get pumped out, the kidneys get less blood. You trigger off a series of uh, compensatory mechanisms. And as time progresses, the kidneys will start absorbing more water from our urine to try and restore this amount of circulating value. When the heart is just stiff, it, this is termed diastolic dysfunction, that it's still able to contract well, but it's not relaxing as well. But as time progresses, diastolic dysfunction gets worse and leads to systolic dysfunction because what's happening now is that the heart cannot relax, the kidneys are filling the body up with more fluid because they're not getting as much, and eventually you're overloading this heart which is already diseased and the heart starts getting weaker when it contracts systolic dysfunction. So eventually you can develop heart failure because of this. What tests do you need to make this diagnosis? The first is that an ECG is easy to do and sometimes on an ECG you will see things like left ventricular hypertrophy. So remember on the ECG the impulse, the size of the impulse can give you a guide as to how much muscle that impulse is having to cross through and in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you may see very large complexes of the ECG and that can be one clue to trigger off the request for an echocardiogram. The echo, as I say, is the gold standard test. It will um, allow you to look for the asymmetry or the abnormal muscle thickening. And most people would say that if you have an unexplained wall thickness of more than 15 millimeters, so you don't have high blood pressure, there's no other good reason, um, the wall thickness should be no more than uh, 10 to 12 millimeters. If you see abnormal muscle wall thickness of greater than 15 millimeters in the absence of blood pressure or any major valve problems, then that makes uh, you very suspicious of this condition caused, called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Again, as I say, the asymmetry is particularly um, important. So if you see asymmetry, if this area is two uh, centimeters and this area is one centimeter, that makes it much more likely that this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Some people get an apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which means the thickness is just around the apex. So that again can give you a clue. The echo will also tell you whether this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has an obstructive component and what it is doing to the mitral valve. Usually you don't need any more tests to make the diagnosis if you have a high quality good echocardiogram but often the echo can be of you know patients are different you may not necessarily get good ultrasound windows so in those patients an MRI scan can be helpful an MRI can get give very good pictures of the heart can help you make a very clear measurement of the ventricle and the walls of the ventricle and that can tell you for sure whether you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One of the other things that an MRI is very good for is an MRI is very good for looking at scar and some people with advanced hypertrophic cardiomyopathy get a lot of scar in their heart which can only be picked up by uh, MRI and there is some evidence now that if you have a lot of scar in the heart then that does increase the risk of malignant heart rhythm disturbances and also increase the risk of sudden death. All other tests largely are to do with risk stratification. So it's, they're not to do with making the diagnosis. They're trying to work out which of these patients with this condition are at a higher risk of something bad happening to them. Because the risk is not homogenous. It's not that every person with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will do badly. Some do fine, you know, some don't need any, don't have any problems all their life. But some patients, can have sudden death, can have malignant rhythms. And the challenge for a doctor is to try and work out who is at a higher risk. So other tests you can do to help you risk stratify who's at a higher risk are halter monitoring, where you monitor the heart rhythm for 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, looking for heart rhythm disturbances. If you have a very irritable heart, if you see a lot of heart rhythm disturbances, then that's really important because that points to a more diseased heart. It's also worth uh, knowing that uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can get conditions like atrial fibrillation. Okay, and atrial fibrillation sometimes may be silent, uh, 
What we do know is those patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and have atrial fibrillation are at particularly high risk of having things like strokes. So if you can detect atrial fibrillation, then those patients need to be anticoagulated regardless. And monitoring the heart over a period of time can help work that out, whether there's any evidence of atrial fibrillation, but even more importantly, whether there's any evidence of ventricular tachycardia. This is ventricular tachycardia with a structurally abnormal heart, higher risk, and those are people that one would be very worried about. Another test you can do for risk stratification is exercise testing. Uh, remember, the problem with this kind of condition is that when the heart is asking for more, not only can the heart become more irritable, but that's when the obstruction becomes really important because the heart is asking for more blood, you're trying to squeeze the blood out, that's where the obstruction can cause the real problem. And that's why a lot of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are more at risk of bad things happening to them during or immediately after exercise. And it is for this reason exercise testing is good because if you find that on exercise testing the blood pressure starts dropping, then that points to a more diseased, uh, hemodynamically incompetent heart. I think it's important also to understand that uh, there is a real scope for genetic testing. Now, we haven't identified all the mutations, so there are lots of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in whom we haven't identified an obvious mutation. That is the limitation of current technology. But uh, there are some mutations that have been identified. So if you're the first degree relative of someone who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they have found a mutation in that person, then they can do a blood test in you and look for the same mutation. And if you carry the same mutation, you're at a higher risk. And if you don't have the same mutation, you're at a lower risk. It's a very important to understand a couple of things. Number one, just because you have the same mutation doesn't mean you will have the same outcome as the other person. So if your relative has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they're fine and nothing bad's happened to them when they're 80, that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have the mutation, you will also be fine. You have to be assessed as an individual and your risk stratification has to be done regardless. Genetic testing is useful because if there's a strong family history of this condition, everyone has this mutation and you don't, then it's highly unlikely that you will have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In terms of screening, apart from genetic testing, all first degree relatives should at least have an ECG and an echocardiogram. And I cannot stress that highly enough. There used to be a presenter called uh, David Frost. He used to do the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, David Frost was found to have a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when he was quite old. Unfortunately, his son, Miles, uh, died suddenly at the age of only 30, I think, when he went out running, again, of undiagnosed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what happens to the patient can be different regardless of the gene that they carry. And therefore, the risk stratification has to be individualized. I think that because the physical, when we're doing an echo, we're looking for the physical changes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the physical changes can be manifest later on in life. So it is recommended that patients have continuous screening. So if you're between the ages of 12 and 18, I would recommend an annual test like an ECG and an echocardiogram every year. If you're above the age of 18, then I think that we tend to do them every five years. You know, So every five years you have an ECG and an echocardiogram to look for changes that may have developed. I think at a certain point, once you're above the age of 50, I think then it's not so necessary if you haven't developed the changes by then. In terms of management, management is a you know really complex subject and I'll try and do another video on it later on, but I hope this gives you an idea of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the genetics, uh, what you do about it. You're someone who has a relative who's been diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and what the symptoms and the physiological changes are within the heart. So I hope you found this useful. I will do the second video soon. Thank you once again for listening to me and thank you for all that you do for me. I'd be so, so grateful if you'd consider sharing this video, if you found it useful, with anyone you think may benefit. Thank you.